So show of hands, who here is running a monolithic application, a big single piece of software? All right, and how many of you have started to split that off into smaller services? Okay, so that's a, that's a good number of you, but there's still Almost a lot of people. Almost everybody. No, no, that was, that was... What was it, 50%, 60%? I think half. Half, okay. So half have started and half are ready to see where this goes. So today we're talking about migrating to microservices in the context of serverless. Serverless is a great fit for building microservices because of how quickly you can get something started and launched. So here we have a cloud function. It's just a couple lines of code, but it's enough to get a proof of concept going. Is that a complete microservice right there? Yes, it's not a very smart one. It's just send, sending some environment variables along to the requester, but that's enough to integrate with something and see if you can use microservices with your application. And if you want to deploy it, that is a one-liner. A few flags there for the first time, but not very hard. So today we're going to follow that step and further journeying into the world of microservices with Into the Woods. They're an online camping gear store, and they have been doing a lot of great business investing in their technology to drive commerce. But before we talk about them too much, it's worth knowing they're an imaginary company. They're going to be an example for us to follow through their journey and then figure out which lessons they've learned might best apply to your own organizations. And since their monolithic application they have now is starting to get technical debt a little fast, slowing down how fast they can build software, it's time for them to start looking into what else they can do. And so one of their developers, Tess, is going to lead us into those new approaches. It's a shame they're totally imaginary. I really like that backpack. I would like to buy that. So Tess, uh, the developer, she, she has this thought about microservices could help us with release velocity um, and dev, dev velocity. Uh, now, uh, she needs to study up first. What, what are these microservices? So let's, let's go through some quick definitions. Monolith, OK, that's where most of your applications, uh, you raised your hands. That's uh, what, when you have a big uh, ball of yarn and everything's sort of connected or could be connected to anything, el anything else. Microservices are when you have specific services that are, that are independently built, deployed, operated, and scaled. Microservices could take requests. They could potentially call each other as well to fulfill requests. Let's zoom in on one of those microservices. What's inside a microservice? There are four things that we think are very important. There are lots of definitions out there. Adam and I think that there are four things that set a microservice apart. One is it has an API. If you're going to talk to the microservice, you talk to the API. No other way in. It has some compute resources. So this is a way to actually run code, run business logic. Most microservices, virtually all, will have some uh, kind of storage, database, file system, in-memory cache, something like that. And then the fourth thing. It's actually a non-technical thing. We think it's very important that the microservice has a team associated with it as well. So if this service breaks, then we know what team to talk to. If this service needs to be refactored, then this team has full ownership, and nobody else can come in and override what they are doing. These guys are the experts on this microservice. So we're going to follow Tessa's microservice journey here. Uh, she's going to lay the foundation. They will build some brand new functionality as a microservice. After that, Tess and team will take uh, existing functionality in the, from the monolith and break that out into a microservice. The, uh, Tess will sit down and plan with her boss for the future of what to do with microservices in the future. And finally, there will be some, some contemplating about what we have learned here today. So first, laying the foundation. Doing this sort of digital transformation where you break up monolith, you change everything, the way all developers are working at your company, also change the way ops, the ops teams are working, uh, requires that's not a big bang. That is like 100 small brown bag lunches, a lot of explaining to people who don't know what these are, getting the team on board. After that, 
Tess would go and talk to her manager about, I want to go the microservice route. The team thinks we should go the microservice route. She, uh, her boss is Sang, who is the CTO of Into the Woods. Now, this conversation can go one of several ways. Tess could go to, to, to Sang and say, we should break up our monolith. Microservices are great. What would Sang say? Do we have any CTOs in the audience? Oh, yeah, OK, very good. I think you would say, CTO there in the back, yeah, of course, let's do it. But what's the ROI? Is that right? OK, very good. So, and this is a hard conversation, because we don't have hard numbers. As developers, we all feel that microservices are easier to manage and build, but, but it's really hard to prove that's the case. So Tess bides her time. A few weeks later, Sang comes to Tess and says, hey, the business people, they want a new a recommendation engine. So based on what's in the cart, they should, we should show recommendations to users. Now Tess is in a much better place because she can say, ah, me and the team, we have this great new approach that will give us greater dev velocity and, uh, for this new, new um, feature you want built. And now Sang is interested. So Beth tells him more. Yeah, it's great that Tess has this opportunity with a new feature that might be valuable but isn't mission critical immediately. Because it, it could be faster for her to build this as part of their existing application, but as a new service, it'll take a little more time to get right, but in the long term, maybe it'll be more sustainable. Tess's approach is going to be iterative, using a lean approach of making sure that at each step of the way through this, they've made the right decisions and are building the right thing. Initially, the main concern is, Will this particular approach of building recommendations as a microservice work on a technical level? And furthermore, will it work as a way of having multiple teams collaborate? Can the API contract prevent having a lot more meetings as a result of having two different software systems? Oh, we don't like meetings, do we? No. no, and if that works out, it's time to move forward and start to see, can this recommendation system drive some, some money? So Tess is using a serverless approach in her exploration here. And as we discussed earlier, that has a number of advantages, especially for an R&D effort like this, where she doesn't have the backing of a big ops team and doesn't have a large pre-established budget. Serverless allows a low infrastructural management solution and a pay-as-you-go model, which means the experiments they run are the experiments they pay for. There are three main serverless options on GCP, Cloud Functions, App Engine, and as you may have heard this morning, Cloud Run, a new product that allows serverless containers to be run. For now, though, Cloud Functions seems like the way to go. This is a very highly scoped recommendation service, and that fits with the tight focus of a function. Here's the architecture of the recommendation service. The monolith is going to make requests uh, make requests of the recommendation service, sending the product IDs from the shopping cart, and the recommendation service will send the recommended product IDs back. Now, for now, for now, this is going to be a very simple system. Dave from marketing has a couple ideas of what they should be recommending that day, and is going to tell the development team to go ahead and deploy those recommendations. So these are hard-coded recommendations, more or less? Yes, but the important thing is that those recommendations eventually show up on a shopping cart page. Mm. So there's always a few challenges from that CTO or from any kind of technical review. Can you really proceed with this? Will it work out? What if that new service doesn't respond? Well, as a slightly lower priority service, asynchronous requests from the monolith with a timeout will allow it to move on if that service has an interruption and does not respond with a recommendation. Is there a scaling challenge? Well, a serverless approach allows you to scale up horizontally quite quickly and then back down again to zero when you're no longer making recommendation requests. And for setup and maintenance, well, Google engineering is helping you with that infrastructure challenge. So you don't have to, to carry a pager for the networking issues. So we're back to the code shown earlier. This is the first iteration of a recommendation service. And it is deployed and working successfully. So with that as a success, it's time to move on to the next iteration. 
can they actually drive some business value by iterating this service forward and making smarter and more intelligent recommendations? If that works, make it even better. And if not, maybe their algorithm isn't working out so well. Only recommending socks all day long. Well, you do need socks, lots of socks for camping. So the architecture that we have for this, this second iteration might look a little like this. This is probably familiar. It's the same API as we saw on the earlier slide. But because the recommendation service is separated from the monolith, it can change its implementation and get more intelligent without the monolith being any the wiser. Now, instead of tests deploying changes when Dave from Marketing makes requests, Dave has access to a Google Sheet into which he can uh, enter the recommendations using it as a quick and dirty back office application instead of tests and team needing to write a whole additional application and database to pull that off. Martin, could you show us what that looks like? Yeah, switch to the demo, please. So I am now wearing the marketing hat. I'm Dave in marketing. Up here, we have the URL for the microservice. Uh, the only product uh, in the cart right now is a map. Uh, so if we hit the microservice, it returns that if you have a, a map in your cart, a compass is recommended. That is because Dave has entered, uh, if, if the requested product is a map, the recommended product is a compass. And if you have more uh, products here, so one product was the map, another one could be boots, and then we get the uh, compass and laces. So boots leads to laces. Now, Dave loves this because he can go in here and say, well, actually, we are rebranding our store. Wouldn't it be cool, Dave thinks, we should be a nautical camping store. Let's send a sextant to people as a recommendation if they if they bought a map or if they have a map in their uh, cart. So now when we reload, now we see that a sextant is recommended here. This gives marketing great power. They, they love how they can edit these as many times a day as, uh, as they feel like. Let's have a look at the code for this. Switch back to the slides, please. So the code to read from a Google Sheet is, is quite, uh, quite easy. First, we uh, create an auth object here uh, with a spreadsheet scope. Notice that there, is, there, are no spread, uh, sorry, there are no passwords, there are no OAuth keys, there are no secrets, none of that stuff, because Tess just gave access to, for the service account that uh, this code runs as. She, gave, uh, she added that service account as a collaborator on the spreadsheet, and boom, all the access is taken care of. After that, we uh, need to create a client object. And then here is actually where the call to Google Spreadsheets is done. We need to send two things along as parameters. As the spreadsheet ID, of course. That's that long ID looking thing that's up in the address bar. And then the range, so what columns and rows we want to read. Once you have that, you have a response.data.values uh, object. And in this one, you have a two-dimensional array of the cells from the spreadsheet. Put a little uh, set logic and stuff on top of this, and you have the service we just ran. And it clogs in at how many rows, lines of code was it in total? Less than 100 lines, than especially 100. without the 30 more for authenticating to, a, to an API on top of it. Yeah, nobody likes to write authentication code. So uh, this is a great success. Sang, he loves it. He says to his Tess, this is amazing. I love this approach. And Tess, of course, she wants to build on that success and say, yes, yes, there are many more ways we can use microservices. We still have this big monolith over here, remember. Now, Tess and team, they sit down and plan out the third iteration of uh, the recommendation engine. They are, have a few different things they could do, like machine learning, perhaps, could drive recommendations instead of the spreadsheet. They could drive it off of the current customer's previous orders. They could analyze orders in aggregate. There are so many things they could do. But before they have time to build version 3, it's time to break out some um, logic from the existing monolith. 
Because Sang comes to Beth and says, look, we are really having a problem with payments. Payments are just not working. We're losing revenue right and left. Could you sprinkle some microservice magic on payments and make them work? What will Beth say here? Yes, of course. Let's do it. This is a great way of getting more microservices into the company. So uh, first off, she looks at the exist existing code for payments. And I don't know, um, many of us have worked in existing code bases, and we may have seen something like this. Sprinkled throughout the monolith are various payment operations that go off to the external payment provider. But also, there are these weird ways where some squiggly line goes off through some weird libraries that we think hits, hits the payment processor. There is also this odd thing where this, this piece of code that hits the previous payment processor. We don't think it's being used, but who knows? It's checked into source control. There's also this other line off in a module that's not about payments at all that goes off to somewhere else, and we're not quite sure where. This is uh, the way existing code bases often look, right? It's, it's sort of accretes over time, and nobody really knows what's going on uh, in all places, and, and nobody dares go in and, and delete it all. So Tess, uh, she thinks, we can really get some focus here with microservices. Let's see how that would be done. You know, it seems like one of the biggest challenges is that payment is really critical, but there's no one who's owning all those pieces. Well, with a microservice approach, you can at least have one a uh, service in the code base in the solution that someone, some team can own and make sure it doesn't start becoming squiggly. So here we only have very straight lines showing the API calls from the monolith making requests to the payment service, which does all the interactions with the payment processor. That also has the nice result of being able to swap out that payment processor if you want to make a change and only touch the one service. That API, that needs to be thought through, though. What exactly are those various operations this payment service should support? Well, before getting into a technical design session, we need to be strategic. A technique called event storming might be used here to figure out what are all the different kinds of things that might be long in a payment service. And this requires both the technical experts and the subject matter experts to get into the room. The technical experts might know specific things about the existing implementation and have a lot of insight into the internal implementation events that matter. But the domain experts are going to have a much clearer idea of all the things that haven't been possible to do so far or might be really important to do in a year that could be critical to inform the architecture. So once you have a long list of events that all seem related to payments, it's time to start separating them out into two piles. What are the events you'll include in your payment service? And what are the events that you're going to exclude as being not quite focused enough to belong here? So we might authorize payments, charge a previously authorized payment, refunds, cancellations. But excluded from that, an inventory function order status and shipping, these are things that might be intimately related to payments, but are a different domain area with different owners and different problems. Maybe those are microservices for the next exercise. All right, so um, Sang, the CTO, and T uh, Tessa's boss, he's really encouraged by this. Now we actually know what we're doing with payments, but he says there's one thing missing here. There we go. There's one thing missing here. Today, with a monolith, we are dropping some payments. Now, you're breaking out the payment service from the monolith, which is great, but we could still have this, result, this uh, problem that we have with the monolith today. So what if the monolith sends an authorization request, like authorize this credit card number for $100, and somebody put a comma in the wrong place in the payment service? or the network is down, or, or the payment processor is down. Then a 500 is returned from the service. OK, that's good. But we're still in this position where we've lost money. We have a payment that hasn't been authorized. We cannot charge this payment later. How, how does your microservice magic fix that? Tess thinks this through, reads it up on it a little bit, and she comes up with a solution. Asynchronous messaging is the way to go. 
Because instead of just having the monolith talk directly to the payment service, it can go through cloud tasks, which is a fairly new product in the Google Cloud platform. Let's see how that would work. So the monolith would send a message, authorize this credit card for $100, just like before. Fire and forget, it needs to do this once only. Cloud Tasks would then send that message on to the payment service. Somebody put a comma wrong, there was a network error, whatever, there's a failure. The payment service is a well-behaved service. It returns a 500 server error. Now here, things are different, start going different from the previous slide. The Cloud Tasks component doesn't give up. It will keep resending that until there's a success. And then as soon as, a, um, as the status code returned from the service is in the 200s, that's how Cloud Tasks knows that, OK, I can lean back. I don't have to send it any more times. Hey, Martin, how long will it keep retrying those, those requests? Yeah, you can set it. Uh, but at the maximum, it can be 30 days. And you can set it to shorter if you want to. You can also adjust the exponential back off behavior here. OK, so uh, Sang says, good, good. That, that, that will work. And you know, I talked to the ops team. They really like this microservice approach. But Tess, that, those cloud functions we had before, JavaScript, we uploaded them to Google. We didn't really know in where and when they were running. The ops team, they want to be a little more hands-on and have more control of the stack here. How can we get that with your microservice approach, Tess? Tess thinks about it and says, wow, it actually, they, do they want containers? And Sang says, yes, containers is exactly what they want. But you know what? Containers is usually a lot of work. We want your, that sort of low ops you've been telling us about, that serverless has, but the control of containers. How would they do that? Yeah, Tess doesn't really have time to stand up a Kubernetes cluster today. Luckily, there's a new solution for this. Cloud Run, a new beta product that marries the worlds of serverless with containers. You can wrap your service in a container, in a Docker file, build a container image, and throw it at the cloud, and it will answer HTTP requests. And then if this service were to keep growing and, and the Into the Woods ops team wanted to get more heavily involved, Cloud Run on GKE would allow them to manage that Kubernetes cluster and move those containers over as they deploy them to the new location. So using Cloud Run, we have all our requests coming in from the monolith, hitting Cloud Tasks now as a way to ensure the resiliency of the system. And then Cloud Tasks will pace out the, uh, pace out the requests to Cloud Run, which will then send them on to the payment processor and store status events in Cloud Firestore a unstructured serverless storage option. So what do you mean when you say serverless for the database there, Adam? You know, a lot of database systems aren't really serverless. Mm -hmm. And serverless compute systems like Cloud Run or Cloud Functions are going to scale much higher than a, a typical single instance is able to go. So that's where Firestore comes in. Cool. It also has some nice features like eventing on updates. So. You might wonder, oh, what kinds of crazy hijinks do I need to get to in my code to build a Cloud Run <laughs> service? This is a pretty simple, uh, almost Hello World-like application written in Go that is going to respond to any request with payment approved, which is how we all would like uh, payment processors to authorize our credit cards. So there was no Cloud Run-specific code there that I could see? No, there is absolutely none. The, the one wrinkle, perhaps, is that the port that your HTTP service needs to bind is uh, going to come in from a port environment variable, which is a little unusual, but it's still flexible. And you can uh, override that as you need to. So this service needs to be wrapped in a Docker file. A Docker file is a relatively straightforward package manifest using industry standards around how containers work, be it GKE or Cloud Run. And this has two stages, a little more complicated than most Docker files. But this has a build stage, which is going to compile our Go code into a binary. And then a production stage, which pulls from a stripped down variant of Linux called Alpine, copy in that binary, and then run it whenever this container is started up. 
Deploying is two commands here. One, using cloud build to take all of this service and Docker file, upload it to cloud build to have a container image prepared and sent on to Google, to Google Container Registry. Then to deploy, gcloud beta run deploy takes that container, puts it into cloud run, and starts you serving. I have found that the first time might be a little bit slow, but most deployments take about 30 seconds. So that service ready to go. Let's start rolling out into production. Now, as a whole new service and doing a mission critical function, you might not want to have it immediately take over all payment processing. Mm -hmm. So the monolith is going to need to be slightly adjusted to send just some of the traffic to this new service. That means, unfortunately, going into all the gnarly old code and making adjustments there. <laughs> Hopefully, you've already got an audit in place to figure out where all that is so it can be deleted. So they deploy, they do this canary release, they send 1% of the traffic through the new payment service. It works great. They send 5% through the new payment process, payment service. It works great. 10%. They eventually 50%. They send 100% through, and it's working. No payments are dropped. Everything scales beautifully. The ops team is happy because they have containers and the magic of serverless. They seem to be a very easy rollout. But we all know that there is no such thing as a trouble-free rollout. There is always something that doesn't go exactly like you expected. In this case, Talia, the controller, we've seen her before, she comes into Tessa's office and says, hey, all my financial reports are broken. This was a week after they ramped up. On Friday, she comes in. All my reports are broken. Why is that? Tessa starts looking at this closer and sees that ah, one of the reports actually has two pieces of data. One piece lives in the monolith, and the other piece now lives in the payment service. The, and before, when everything lived in the monolith, it was far easier to run these reports because both pieces of data were in the monolith. How do we fix this? This, by the way, if you've been working on migrating to microservices, you will have seen this problem in one form or another. Or if you haven't yet, you soon will. This is data fragmentation. Big problem, especially for reporting. So of course, the problem here is we have the data over here on the far left, and on the right is Talia, who wants her report, right? Well, uh, it turns out, Tess looks into this, and it turns out that Cloud Firestore has uh, triggers. So whenever something is written, uh, she can trigger, build a new service, an ETL service that is triggered. It can sanitize the data. It can do some light data transformation. And then put the data in a data lake, a reporting or reporting service, if you wish. The monolith has an existing reporting module uh, that one needs to be repointed to the, this data lake. So it sends its transactions and its orders to the data lake. Now, all the data is in the data lake, the reporting service. This is kind of like in the monolith days, they probably ran a separate reporting server. This is the equivalent in, in serverless uh, land, microservice land. Now that all the data sits in the data lake, they can now uh, create build the reports off of that. So Talia had to go without her reports for a few days. It was uh, not ideal. They had forgotten about reports when they did the event storming but they didn't lose any money. Black Friday rolls around. Now we're running into a big problem. Sang goes into Tess's office and say, all the API calls to the payment processor are returning quota exceeded errors. What should we do? All hands on deck. What is going on? This is something that if you're migrating to microservices, if you haven't run into this sort of problem before, you soon will. The problem here, of course, is you have a chain of components talking to each other, and the, they all have different scaling characteristics. So some of them scale very well, and others not so well. For example, uh, they may have a contractual rate limit with a payment processor. You can only send one transaction a second or something like that. You might also have seen it if the component on the far right is a SQL database. 
that's not serverless and doesn't scale as well. You might have seen it if you connect to an HR system or a, a CMS system or other system that can't handle the kind of load that serverless can handle. What do we do? If you read and check out the literature, you will see lots of, of uh, thoughts on how to fix this. Like you can write all this code to write a circuit breaker component, or you can implement back pressure that leads back through the ripples back through this chain. There's so many things you can do. Most of them involve a lot of coding. And we all know if you write a lot of new code to fix something, you might fix it. You will also introduce a lot new, of new bugs. Then Tess remembers they picked Cloud Tasks. Cloud Tasks actually has this knob you can turn. You can adjust the rate. So the monolith can throw any amount of transactions per second at Tasks. Tasks will absorb it. And then it will only send out as many to, to Cloud Run as many as it's asked to. So Beth goes in and checks the Cloud uh, Tasks console. And she sees that, oh my gosh, we have a lot of backed up tasks here. 2,500 transactions are sitting there and, and waiting to be authorized or charged. As, because they're using Cloud Tasks, they can go in and change, turn that knob, and set max tasks dispatched per second to one. The default is five. They turn it down to one. Now, all of a sudden, they're only sending one per second to the payment provider. The payment provider accepts the traffic, and it'll take, after about 45 minutes or so, they will have worked through this backlog. Excellent. Uh, Tess is still a little shaky, shake, shake, shaken up over this, uh, but Sang says, this is actually a great job. Any major transformation, any major migration will have some hiccups along the way. This uh, microservice approach lets us move faster and experiment more. He loves it. Tess, for her part, she's just very happy that this worked out. Well, now that Tess has been undoubtedly promoted to chief microservices scientist of Into the Woods, it's, uh, <laughs> it's time to start thinking about a more deliberative approach to how they do microservices in the future. So one lesson that she might have learned from all of this is that a microservice is a good fit for well-understood problems. A user profile service might be easy for anyone to understand and anticipate in advance, so maybe that can be created. But for harder challenges, for areas that need a lot more innovation and exploratory development, trying to stay on the path of a microservice might be, might be a source of slowdowns, might get in the way a little bit. So it's important not to always be too focused on building a microservice on the things you don't yet have a, have a mastery of. Moving from there, Sang and Tess, they might have talked about how many microservice do we, microservices do we want to have? Should we have 1,000 by the time we're done with all of this? Well, feel that out as well. Move a little bit more slowly. You see. The, the trade-off of microservices is really between developers and operators, or at least development and operations. When you have a small service, it is much easier for a developer to really get into all of the code and develop an expertise in it. And so when you have more small services, development complexity might go down. But as you add more and more services and more interactions between them, you start to gain more operational complexity, more deployments, more cascade failure possibilities, and harder troubleshooting. So there's a sweet spot in there. That trade-off is going to be very unique to every organization because it's very particular to the people. Do you have more senior operations engineers or more senior application developers? Between those two, you'll find your sweet spot. Now, with a serverless approach where you've taken a lot of that ops overhead and pushed it onto the cloud, that line for ops complexity will flatten a little bit. And that means your sweet spot can slide over, and it becomes more reasonable to have a larger number of microservices in your arsenal. So as they've been adding new microservices, and splitting some off from the monolith, each of those services 
has a stakeholder. This is an owner, whether it's on the business side or otherwise, that understands that service and the role of that technology in the company. They can be a champion of that technology through the rest of the company, but they can also be an ongoing subject matter expert for the service. This kind of direct line of ownership also prevents a lot of confusion about what priorities are for an individual service. So what did we learn here? What are the, what are the lessons? Tess sits down and thinks carefully about this. This is lessons that we hope you can apply where you, uh, in your organizations. One is Conway's Law. Uh, this was, uh, uh, this was uh, created by Melvin Con Conway. He wrote it down uh, over 50 years ago. It is as true today as when it was uh, first written down. Any of you who has worked on systems, or if you worked on a website for an organization, you've experienced this. What this law is saying is that if you have a certain type of organization, organizational structure, that organizational structure will lead to any system that you build will be a mirror image of that organization. You've seen this when building websites for companies. They will, the website hierarchy, the page hierarchy, uh, tends to follow organ, or the org chart. So if you have many small teams, you will get many small uh, microservices. That means that you can actually do an inverse Conway maneuver here. If, if you want small services over there on the right, then you create many small teams. If you want a big monolith, you have just one big room full of developers, and everybody's on the same team. Next observation is that weightlifting is really hard if you do it by yourself. But weightlifting becomes a lot easier if you have like five or six of your friends to help you. So the monolith is really doing a heavy lift here before, but it's far easier when the other services are, are helping out. As a matter of fact, the monolith might, doesn't have to lift at, do as much work here because the other services help out. You might even discover that the monolith is homesick one day and can't come in and lift weights, and the other services can sort of do the lift, and eventually you might have only services. That's far into the future, far into the woods, but it's something to consider and think about. It's also something that we need to be a little uh, careful when we talk to the monolith team about. We don't talk about how we're going to shut down their stuff. As a matter of fact, this also has another name uh, that you might have heard of that was a little too confrontational for a slide, we felt. Martin Fowler calls this the strangler pattern. This is where you have a tree in the forest, and all these vines grow up around it and suck energy from the tree and eventually killing the tree, and then all the vines are there. But team weightlifting, let's talk, do that instead. Then you need an intrapreneur. So an intrapreneur is an, somebody who has an entrepreneur mindset but works inside an organization. This was Tess in this case. You need that intrapreneur. You also need that opportunity. And in this case, it was the recommendation engine. And that set them on the path to microservices. So you can be the intrapreneur in your organization. So keep looking for those opportunities.